Excellent. So, um, yeah, our next speaker will be Yaroslav Trinka, uh, who will be heretically talking about negative amplitudehedron geometry and amplitudes at strong coupling. Thanks, Yara. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark, and uh, like to thank our organizers uh, for inviting me and organizing this nice uh, annual traditional conference, hopefully last time in the virtual setting. And I will talk about uh, some work with uh, Nimar Kanihamet and Johannes Hen about uh, the connection between amplitudehedron geometries, but now not positive, but negative, and uh, amplitudes uh and uh, the connection to strong coupling so we would be able to make this connection we have been trying to do for a long time okay so uh, the motivation is to use uh, the amplitude hedron picture for planar n equals four uh, do some all loop order calculation not uh, for the full amplitude but in certain uh, uh for a certain approximation and then uh, using some recent result, uh, do the strong coupling expansion compared to integrability. And eventually, which I will not do here, to study uh, what, what is, uh, if there is some strong coupling geometry, like the amplitude hedron, which, which is uh, for weak coupling. Okay, so the outline is uh, first to do some uh, review of uh, the amplitude hedron picture uh, for planar n equals four scattering amplitudes. Then I will uh, do a small generalization and define what are the negative geometries. And I will show that they will naturally give uh, the new picture for the logarithm of the amplitude, not for the amplitude itself, but for the logarithm of the amplitude to all loop orders. And uh, starting from that, we will define some IR finite object uh, after integration. Uh, by freezing one of the loops and integrating over all others. And there will be some nice uh, connection to the Wilson loop picture for the, for the dual Wilson loops. This object also naturally arises from there. And then uh, using this framework, uh, we will be not able to perform the all-loop order calculation for the full object, but we will do some approximation, which will uh, consist uh, of taking uh, into account some special class of negative geometries. And these will, we will be able to uh, evaluate to all loops, resum and uh, expand and strong coupling. Okay. So let's start with uh, reviewing some of the basics of amplitudehedron. So in this talk, uh, we will be only interested in four point amplitudes in planar n equals four. We will not need any higher point uh, information here. And the amplitudehedron picture uh, uh, is for the all-loop integrand. So the all-loop integrand here, I will uh, I will always denote it as omega, some differential form, which is a D-log form on the amplitudehedron geometry, but it's also the uh, the integrand to all-loop orders. And to get the final amplitude, we have to integrate. Now the amplitude uh, M4, uh, the scattering amplitude, is uh, IR divergence and needs to be regulated. But of course, the integrand form, uh, omega, is rational and finite. Uh, now, the amplitudehedron geometry is a picture for this rational form. And uh, uh, we conveniently use uh, kinematical variables, which work nicely in the planar limit, called momentum twisters. And we are only at four points, so we will have four external momentum twisters, z1, z2, z3, z4. Uh, which capture the information about external kinematics, about external momenta and helicities. And uh, uh, in the momentum twister space, there are points in, the, in P3, in the projective space. And now the loops uh, will be represented by lines in this space. And we will denote these lines AB, uh, uh, which, uh, which is the meaning of two, two arbitrary points on, on that line AB, but only the line. Uh, is relevant here and it represents the loop momentum. Now uh, we fixed uh, the convex external data for four point. It's only saying that the four bracket one two three four, which is a four by four determinant, uh, uh, made from the four uh, external momentum distances, is positive. And the amplitudehedron here is a configuration space of all these lines AB, all the allowed. Uh, which satisfies certain conditions. So uh, first, the one-loop amplitudehedron is a configuration of just all lines AB of a single line. 
and it must satisfy uh, certain positivity conditions. So four brackets a b i i plus one, uh, which are a b one two a b two three a b three four and b one four must be positive. And the other four brackets, AB13 and AB24, must be negative. When again, these four brackets stands from the uh, stand for the four by four determinants made uh, from the momentum visitors. And the line AB is here represented by two arbitrary points on this line. And it doesn't matter which points we choose, only the line really enters here. Now, uh, we can, for four points, everything uh, is simple and we can conveniently parameterize this line AB by putting uh, one of the point on a plane one, two, four, and the other point on a plane two, three, four in this particular way. When uh, these positivity conditions uh, reduces to just having the four parameters which parameterize this loop line to be positive. So the amplitude hedron space is given by the configuration of all these AB lines with these parameters X, Y, Z, W being positive, and that's it. So once we have this space, uh, we can define the logarithmic form on this space, the D-log form. And because all the parameters X, Y, Z, W are positive, uh, so they range from zero to infinity, uh, the D-log form just takes the very simple form DX over X, DY over Y, DZ over Z, DW over W, because this form has poles at, let's say, X is zero and X is infinity, which are exactly the boundaries of the amplitude hedron space here. And this is true for all of these four parameters. Now we can uh, we can go back from this parameter uh, from this uh, form in terms of uh, these four parameters, writing it back uh, using momentum twisters, so in some more uh, covariant form, and then uh, the D-log form takes this uh, particular form when you see four poles in the denominator, and here there is actually only a trivial numerator and a measure d mu, and uh, this form is exactly the four point one loop box integral written in the momentum visitor space. Yeah. So uh, this integral we would usually write in momentum space, but doing the change of variable to momentum visitor space, we exactly get this formula, which is a correct expression for the 4.1 loop amplitude in planar n equals four. Now, uh, once we go to two loops, uh, uh, we talk about the configuration space of two lines, which I will denote as A, B, and C, D, just for historic reasons. And uh, each line uh, lives in the one loop amplitude hedron. So separately, they are they both live in this one loop configuration space, which means satisfying uh, the inequalities here. So just two copies of these inequalities for each of the lines. If we impose nothing else, and that would be it, uh, it's very easy to see that the, the, the thing that we get is basically uh, the geometric problem would uh, factorize into two one loop problems. And uh, the D log form on this space would be just the product of these two one loop box integrands. Uh, so, of course, that's obviously not the two loop amplitude. So, we have to impose extra condition uh, to, uh, to get the two loop amplitude. And this extra condition is a mutual positivity condition between these two lines. So, the four bracket made from A, B, and C, D. So again, it's a four by four determinant now of these four points is positive. And if we use the same parameterization as before for parameterizing each of the, these lines in the one loop amplitude hedron using these X, Y, Z, W parameters, which are positive for both sets, for both A, B, and C, D, this mutual uh, positivity condition is a quadratic condition in these parameters. So it's uh, this. Uh, this expression d d12 must be positive. Uh, now it's slightly non-trivial to actually find the d log form on this space. One needs to triangulate that space because we have nine inequalities for eight parameters. So we have to triangulate the space and find small regions when each parameter is bounded from the lower to upper bound, and then we can find the d log form. Uh, so uh, the result in uh, these parameters is this particular form, which uh, also going just back uh, to the usual momentum twisters, uh, one can see that uh, it gives the, if we then expand it in terms of traditional uh, uh, loop integrals, it gives uh, the cyclic sum over the double box integrals. 
uh, but one needs to do already some work here to uh, to find the Dirac form for this space. So this is the two loop amplitude and the two loop amplitude we draw. Now, if we go to L loops at uh, general L, we have configuration space of L lines, A, B, I. Each line separately lives in the one loop amplitude hedron. So for four point, we can again use this parameterization using X, Y, Z, W, where all of these parameters are positive. That puts the line in the one loop amplitude hedron. That's it. But for any two lines, we have to also impose additional quadratic inequality. And uh, again, saying that uh, the four bracket of now ABI and ABJ is positive. And uh, this is a lot of conditions. So in this usual parameterizations, we would define our object DIJ, which is a quadratic, uh, quadratic uh, it's a polynomial in, uh, in these X, Y, Z, W parameters. And uh, now all of them must be satisfied. All of my, them must be positive. So this, the number of condition grows like L square for large L, while the number of parameters is only for L, for L loops. So this is quite a complicated space, but <clears throat> that's not that surprising because uh, the D-log form on this space uh, should give us the general L-loop integrant uh, for four-point amplitudes in planar n equals four super young males, which is a very complex function. Yeah. And uh, if we get this form and then we expand it uh, using uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, Feynman integrals, yeah, we would get for general L, of course, we would get countless number of terms. Okay, so uh, now we will introduce some graphic notation, which will be very useful uh, for our work. And uh, for uh, each uh, uh, for each loop line, we will uh, each loop line A B I. Uh, we will use a vertex, just a black dot. And for each mutual positivity condition between these uh, between uh, these loop lines, we will use a blue dashed link. Okay. So and uh, the picture that I will draw will denote the D-log form on this space. So uh, the picture will give you the positivity conditions, the positive geometry, uh, and also uh, and the picture also stands for the, the picture stands for the form on that positive geometry. So for the two loop case, for one loop case, there is just one dot. There is nothing else. For the two loop case, uh, we will have two dots, which represent the loop, uh, the loop lines A, B, and C, D. And uh, the blue dashed link uh, corresponds to having a mutual positivity condition between these two lines. OK, so this, this would correspond to the, uh, to the two loop integral, to the D-log form on the two loop amplitude integral. Now, the general L-loop uh, D-log form, the L-loop integral, uh, is then given by a complete graph. So we have L dots, L vertices, and they are, con they are completely connected. They are connected to all other vertices. And this picture here on the bottom of the slide then uh, stands for the D-log form on this geometry. So this really corresponds to the D-log form for the L-loop integral. We are, this is just graphic notation. We are not calculating it yet. Okay. So, uh, so this was uh, just a review of, uh, of the amplitudehedron, and now we will introduce negative geometries. So, uh, so in the usual definition, we have this condition that ABCD is positive, but we can also consider a, a positive geometry when ABCD is negative. So we just uh, reverse uh, the sign of this bracket while still keeping AB and CD separately in the one-loop amplitudehedron or for general L-loops. Each of the lines is in one loop amplitudehedron, but we will now change these mutual conditions. So, in the graphic notation, uh, we will be using a, a thick uh, red line for these negativity conditions between two loop lines, and uh, there is a sum rule because uh, if we have a, if we have one space then ABCD is negative, other space then ABCD is positive. We take the union of these spaces then there is no condition on ABCD. And this is, of course, true at the level of forms. So these pictures stand for the form. So if we add uh, the form for this ABCD negative space and ABCD positive space, which is the amplitude drawn, which is the amplitude, uh, the, the sum of them is the form on the space when there is no condition on ABCD. In this case, it's just the one loop square. 
form because there is there is no condition uh, between these loops. So again, it just factorizes. Now, uh, now what we will do is to take this uh, relation and express uh, the positive link between two points as an empty link or no link minus the negative link. Yeah, so we can purely at the graphic level we can take this completely uh, this complete graph and express uh, these uh, blue links in terms of no links and uh, red links, which correspond to the negative condition. And uh, then uh, just trivially, we will get uh, this relation that this one graph we can express as a sum of uh, over all graphs, where now all the links are negative, or there are maybe, it's not, a, not necessarily a complete graph, so some of the links are missing, and the ones which are there are negative. And we just sum over all these graphs, and there is an extra minus sign uh, raised to the number of edges which has the graph. Okay, so this is the general formula. So let me just give an example for L equals three. So this is a free loop case. We have three vertices in our graphs. And uh, here the sum on the right hand side is a sum of, uh, of uh, these four different terms when uh, the first one has no red link, then the second one has one, the third one has two, and the last one has, is a complete uh, graph with uh, these negative links. So this is the expansion here we would get for the free loop amplitude, uh, for the B log form on the free loop amplitude hedron can be written in terms of these four, uh, in terms of these four terms. Okay. Uh, so now what we will do is to write a formal sum over all loops. Yeah. We are not calculating yet what these omega L A L are, uh, but uh, we can just dress uh, each of these L loop uh, D log forms, L loop uh, integrands with appropriate power of G square raised to the power of L and sum over all L, okay? When uh, the first one kind of the three level contribution here is one. Now we are factoring out the 4.3 level amplitude. Now, uh, just uh, uh, at the, the graphical level, the formula for this omega k uh, exponentiates. Yeah. So here we wrote each of uh, this L loop omega as a sum over all graphs with red links. But uh, now if, uh, if we do this sum, address it with g square and sum over all L, we can also rewrite it just using some graph theory as the exponential over uh, exponential of the sum of only connected graphs. Yeah? So while here in this sum there were all possible graphs, here there are only connected graphs. Okay, with again some minus signs and dressed properly with uh, with the g square. So now we have the all loop uh, amplitude written. As, uh, as an exponential uh, integrand for the amplitude, written as an exponential of uh, this sum over, connect, uh, over all connected graphs with, uh, with uh, uh, red links, with the negative links. And each of the graph, again, stands for some uh, D log form over some positive geometry, which is not an amplitude hedron geometry, it has these negative conditions. Okay, so now we have an exponential here. So we can take the logarithm of both sides of this equation and calculate the log of omega. And that will be given by the sum over these negative geometries. And we can then again expand in G square or in G and take uh, the, the power G square to L and uh, define the L loop logarithm. And that is given by, uh, again, the sum over all connected graphs with L vertices, okay? So, uh, so this is what we are left with. We have the L, the L loop uh, logarithm of the amplitude, uh, the integrand for the L loop logarithm of the amplitude is a sum over the D log forms on these negative geometries. So that's where we end it now. Any questions before I go farther? about any of the graphs and links and what it means. 
Okay, so this is our new representation for the logarithm of the amplitude at our loops. And now uh, we will discuss what is special about this particle representation and why do we care and uh, what are the properties of uh, these graphs and uh, the Dioc forms which represent uh, these uh, geometries. And it's related all uh, to the collinear safety, collinear divergencies. So first, uh, uh, let me just uh, kind of repeat what is special about uh, this positivity condition ABCD is positive and why it was so crucial for defining the geometry which can give uh, the scattering amplitude, the planar scattering amplitudes. Uh, the reason is that the mutual positivity condition, the ABCD is positive, ensures that the object is planar. And we can see it on one particular example uh, when we consider a cut. Uh, when uh, the line AB cuts two of the uh, two of the uh, propagators one two and three four, and the line CD cuts propagators one four and two three, so this is this is a cut which is not allowed in planar amplitudes in two planar amplitudes uh, because it just corresponds to some crossing lines and it's not uh, it's not supported. And uh, we can just see that if we localize the line AB in this particular configuration and line CD in this particular configuration, we will actually force the ABCD bracket uh, to be negative. So this will be in violation with the positivity of this bracket, which is, which is a part of the amplitude drawn definition. So, and this is just one example, the positivity condition kind of uh, uh, make sure that none of these non-planar cuts are allowed. Uh, from the other point of view, if uh, now we give up on the positivity condition on ABCD, uh, we saw in this simple two loop example that we are just getting one loop square amplitude. And the one loop square amplitude is not planar. Yeah, it's a product of two one loop amplitudes, but it's not planar in a sense of planar diagrams. The product of two planar diagrams is not a planar diagram. And similarly, uh, the, the space with ABCD is negative, also is not expressible in terms of planar objects. So it's also not planar. Yeah. From the other point of view, the ABCD is negative conditions ensures a different thing, not planarity, but uh, certain cancellation in collinear region. Let me just, uh, uh, let me just review uh, about uh, the uh, collinear configurations. So uh, we are looking at the configuration of uh, the line AB such that the AB passes through some point, let's say Z2, and lies in a plane one, two, three. So this is a particular configuration in the momentum twister space. Uh, we can parameterize it like that when the parameter alpha here is forced to be positive by the one loop amplitude hedron conditions. In momentum space, uh, if we just translate it, this will correspond to uh, putting the loop momentum L to be proportional to some external momentum P1. Yeah, so uh, the L is in the, uh, the L is collinear with P1 here. Now, uh, this configuration in the momentum twister space is now forbidden because of the negativity condition. So if we have the condition between A, B, and C, D to be negative, then plugging uh, this configuration for the line AD, we find uh, that we get a sum of two positive terms. So then ABCD is necessarily positive. But if we started with, with the geometry, so this configuration will be not allowed in such a geometry with uh, such a negative geometry. Okay, now uh, for the connected graph, each vertex is connected to at least one other vertex. So uh, that link, the, the way how the vertex is connected to the other vertex uh, is a mutual negativity condition. And if we try uh, to access with line AB, let's say this, uh, this line represented here by this vertex, the collinear region, it will be, uh, it will be not allowed because there is the link connecting to some other vertex and that negativity condition would be violated if we try to do it with this line AB. 
So we can never access uh, the collinear region with any of these lines in the connected graph. If the graph wasn't connected, it would be a different story. But if the graph is connected, we can never access a collinear region. And furthermore, we can never even take a subset of all uh, the loop lines represented by these vertices and access collinear region. The only way how to access collinear region is actually to take all of the lines at the same time and access the collinear region. In that case, all of these mutual conditions are zero because all the lines would intersect. And in that case, we don't violate these conditions, but that's the only case when we can access collinear region. So now why, why did I care so much about accessing collinear region with these lines? And that's because it's related to IR divergences. Uh, the IR divergences are uh, caused uh, by singularities of the integrand in the collinear region. So per, of course, there are also sub divergences, but for any plus four super young males, if you have an integrand, which uh, has no collinear support. So you cannot, uh, the integrand has no residue when you take the loop momentum and put it in the collinear region or momentum twister space, this loop line and put it in the collinear region. There will be no IR divergence. Uh, now we can have uh, IR finite integrals, which either have no massless corners because the massless corners are exactly the ones which generate these collinear regions or they have massless corners, but they have special numerators, like uh, these curl pentagons we have been discussing for a long time. Now, the connected graph with negative links uh, forbids any excess of these loop lines in a collinear region, except this very special case when all the lines go there at the same time. Now, if we take the forms, uh, which are represented by these graphs, and integrate them, over the real Minkowski contour, what we get is mildly divergent functions. Okay, so the general L loop, uh, the L loop integrand for the amplitude would diverge like one over epsilon to two L in dimensional regularization or any other regularization. But uh, for these, uh, uh, but these uh, uh, D log forms represented by these connected graphs with negative links, they would only diverge as one over epsilon squared. So they will have only this very mild divergence. And uh, so for the simplest example, uh, we would get this graph with one link, two loops, at three loops, uh, the connected graph which, uh, which contributes to our result are these graphs. All of them, each, the, each graph represents a function which is one over epsilon squared divergent. Now, uh, we said that this expansion in terms of connected graphs was for the logarithm of the amplitude. So we can also look from the other side, from the traditional point of view, uh, what is the logarithm of the amplitude? Well, it's just taking the amplitude, uh, the perturbative expansion of uh, the, the scattering amplitude where this is a three level, one loop, two loop, three loop, four loop, and so on. Take the logarithm and expand in coupling. And we get this particular combinations of uh, amplitudes at two loop. We get a two loop amplitude minus one loop square, uh, one half, one loop square at three loop. We get this particular combinations. And each of these combinations is only one over epsilon square divergent, while each term, like two loop amplitude, is one over epsilon to the four divergent, as well as. Uh, the square of the one loop amplitude. So the IR divergence for the scattering amplitude, the four point scattering amplitude in N equals four has a simple structure to all loops. Yeah, the logarithm of the amplitude can, can be written in this particular form. There is a one over epsilon square piece. That piece is multiplied by appropriate power of uh, the coupling constant and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, an object called gamma cusp. Which is, uh, which is just uh, some uh, numerical, uh, very interesting uh, object. Okay, so, uh, so, okay, so we are, uh, we now left the situation with these objects which are one over epsilon square divergent. Uh, our expansion in terms of negative geometries, which we uh, presented here, uh, is, an, is an expansion which makes this one over epsilon square uh, divergence manifest. Yeah, each term here is one 
over epsilon square divergent. These objects are not diagrams of Agatha, not Feynman diagrams of any sort. These are D-log forms on certain positive geometries given by these uh, negative uh, mutual conditions. Okay, but now we would like to define something which is IR finite, such that uh, we can do more things with that. And uh, as we said before, uh, the IR divergence in disconnected graphs and also in the logarithm of the amplitude come from all lines which go uh, at the same time in the collinear region, which is a part of the integration region. So if we freeze one of the lines and don't integrate over that line and integrate over all other lines, we get an IR finite object. Because if we take a subset, if we take L minus one uh, of the loop lines, we can never access the, the collinear region with that subset and therefore there is no divergence. So uh, for each graph, we can exactly define this object integrating over only L minus one lines, not all L of them. And this object is IR finite for each connected graph. And the log of the amplitude is a sum of these connected graphs. So of course, that's true also for the log of the amplitude. So, so now we can define the same object as the logarithm of the amplitude as the sum over all connected graphs. But here, one of the loop lines is picked and it's frozen and it's not integrated over. So we denote it uh, with, uh, yeah, in the graph, we denote it like that. And anyway, and then we get an expansion over all these graphs with a certain number of vertices dressed with uh, some minus signs and powers of power coupling. When each of this line, again, corresponds to negative link. I denoted with red line before, and now it's just a black line. It's the same thing. So what we get here is an IR finite function of only a single cross ratio. So just based on the dual conformal symmetry, we can only find a single cross ratio, which can be built here from one line and uh, four points. So the line, this loop line, we are not integrating over. We denote A, B naught. And there are four points, Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. And there is a single cross ratio that you can build from that. This object, the way how we define it, is the same as the one which appears in the Wilson loop picture as the ratio of uh, the four point Wilson loop uh, in the fundamental representation with an extra Lagrangian insertion at the point X naught uh, divided normalized by the Wilson loop itself. So, so here we denote it as this calligraphic F in that Wilson loop picture is denoted as f is the it's the same function up to some rescaling with g square and some pre and some overall pre factor. So the same object has been studied before. Okay, and we can find uh, we can uh, do our calculation, uh, do the integration, and uh, integrate uh, these functions, getting this finite function f of z and also coupling. At two loops, there was just a single graph, uh, which we can easily integrate and get uh, this single, uh, this uh, simple result. At three loops, we got uh, three different connected graphs with this special marked point. Two of them are extremely simple. You can again see that uh, there are just some log squares and pi's, while the third one is a little bit more complicated. In this case, it's just still just classical polylogs, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated function of z. Okay, so yeah, if we go to higher and higher loop order, it just gets more and more complicated. We have to uh, do these integrations. However, uh, we will be now able to make some approximation and uh, calculate this function f uh, to all loops. And this, uh, uh, this leads us to trees and ladders in the sense of these uh, negative geometries. So in this uh, free loop case, we saw that uh, two of these uh, diagrams, two of these graphs, had much simpler results than the last one. Yeah, if you look here, these two are very simple, while this one is a little bit more complicated. Well, how do they differ, these three graphs? Well, these two graphs look like tree graphs, while this one is a loop graph. But loop graph in this uh, in the loop of loop space. Yeah, uh, I, I remind you that each of these points corresponds to a loop line. And uh, this loop is in this space of loop lines. In fact, okay. 
In fact, uh, we can find uh, the DLOG form for all three drafts. And uh, it takes a very particular, particularly simple form when uh, uh, there is some denominator factor and uh, then the two loop numerator factor for each negative link. While once we go to loop, the form becomes more and more complicated. Uh, we also have a closed formula for all one loop graphs, but yeah, but, but, but they are a little bit more involved. Now, note that both these three and loop graphs have the same number of standard loops. So this is a for loop object in the traditional sense. This is also a for loop object. This is also a for loop object, but they have a different number of these internal loops. Okay, so now we will make some approximation and we consider only three graphs. Yeah? So only graphs which don't have these internal loops and uh, these internal coming from these negativity conditions. Now we can even consider an even special, more special class uh, of three graphs, which are letters. So which are just, so, so the negativity conditions are here are given by these lines. And uh, we again dress them uh, with the G square and now we can resum them. And now this function of G and Z, the, the coupling and the cross ratio, where, where we sum over all loops, we can actually solve for. Uh, and the reason is that we can find a differential operator, which acts very simply uh, on, uh, on uh, these structures. So uh, let me just say that the differential operator is a Laplace operator and we get a differential equation for the sum of these ladder graphs. Uh, and uh, we can solve the differential equation using some boundary conditions and we get this function which is a very simple function. And this is now true for all values of coupling. Uh, next, we can also uh, try to do it for all trees. So not just the letters, but all graphs which look like trees. And for that, uh, there will be some uh, useful uh, observation that the generating function for all trees, which have, a, which have a special link, so this extra link, so kind of uh, this frozen loop is connected uh, by a link to the rest of the graph while all three graphs would just have uh, uh, this frozen loop at a random location. Uh, just from the graphical uh, analysis, uh, this, uh, the sum of all the trees is an exponential of sum of all the trees with, uh, uh, with this special location of uh, this frozen loop. Anyway, the differential operator also, using the same differential operator, we can find the differential equation now for all the trees. And uh, we can solve it. It has this particular form. Uh, you can see it depends on G, depends on Z, and depends on this A. But this A cannot be solved analytically. It satisfies this condition. So it's some, uh, it's some function of G. Uh, but uh, yeah, we cannot solve it analytically. Anyway, but this is the result. Now what we can do, so these functions of letter and tree are, function, uh, are valid for all values of coupling. So we can go to strong coupling and we can also find the contributions to the cusp anomalous dimension. So let's go to strong coupling. So now for the letters, for these negative geometries, which had this letter form, uh, if we go to large G to strong coupling, they are exponentially suppressed. Yeah? They, at large G, they behave like e to the minus G and they are exponentially suppressed. This is very similar to what we would get from summing the actual leather diagrams, not these leather geometries, but the actual leather diagrams for phi cube theory. We would get the similar exponential suppression at large value of coupling. If we dress all these diagrams with proper power of G, we sum it and uh, do the same analysis, it's also suppressed. However, I just now to know that our letters are not the same letters as these letter diagrams because our letters are delog forms of these negative geometries. The thing that they have in common is the number of internal propagators in momentum twister space. So number of these propagators is two here and it would be also two here corresponding to these negative conditions. So there is some similarity, but these are not the same object, but they have the same behavior at large G at strong coupling. Now the exponential suppression is in contrast with the actually full uh, result for FZ, which, uh, which is linear in G at strong coupling. Yeah, it's not suppressed, it actually goes as G. Now, 
if we do uh, the same strong uplink expansion for our trees, not just the ladders, but all trees, we find that our trees behave as con uh, be behaves like, like O1 in G at strong coupling. So we are missing the G term, we are missing the leading term, but our result has the one over G expansion, like the actual result uh, for, for this amplitude object at uh, large G. So, uh, so there is some similarity, but we are missing uh, the leading term. So there were, that therefore the trees miss some of the physics of these other diagrams, these loop diagrams in the loop space. Okay, now let me get uh, to the connection to gamma cusp. And uh, while for the full function of Z, we see that uh, uh, these approximations miss some of the important pieces, the letter is just giving a completely wrong picture and uh, the trees, the full trees still missing the leading piece. For the gamma cusp is much better. So now, uh, so, uh, so now uh, the gamma cusp, we already have this formula for the logarithm of the amplitude, where here is the cusp on almost dimension. Uh, we can uh, again dress uh, the particular coefficient uh, at L loop with G to the 2L and sum over all else. So we get gamma cusp as a function of G. And uh, the gamma cusp as a function of G can be obtained from this function F. And that was shown in these papers earlier. Uh, I will not go through the procedure, but we can extract it from that. So once we have this function of f uh, for arbitrary g and z, we can extract the gamma cusp from that. Now for the sum of all letters, we can do actually explicitly the calculation and we get this formula, which is very close to something called gamma octagon, which uh, was introduced in literature recently and controls the six point remainder function in particular limit. It's, it's actually the same function up to just some change of factors. So this is the result for the letters, very simple result. And uh, for the trees, uh, we have to do a little bit more work, but, and we cannot solve analytically for, gamma, uh, for, the, uh, for the gamma tree, for the gamma cusp of uh, these tree graphs, but we can go to the strong coupling. Now going to strong coupling, this is an expansion for the gamma cusp, for the, the real gamma cusp in N equals four super young nodes as predicted by integrability. Uh, so at strong coupling, it starts as G and then there is a one over G term and so on, an expansion in uh, one over G. The gamma letter uh, doesn't have the one over G term. So it starts as a G, then there is a constant term and then there is something which is exponentially suppressed. So it's less non-perturbative than actually uh, the real gamma cusp, which has this uh, expansion in one over G. Yeah, the, the letters just give uh, just this piece and miss this one over G terms. However, the trees have uh, qualitatively exactly the same expansion at large G. So it starts as G, then one over G, one over G square and so on. So it gives all the correct qualitative behavior. The explicit coefficients are different, of course, because yeah, this is a, just an approximation, but it's very interesting that the qualitative behavior is the same. Uh, we can also compare how the approximation is good at weak coupling uh, by uh, looking at the ratio of uh, coefficients of, uh, uh, of gamma cusp, real gamma cusp, and the one calculated from three S letters. Obviously the trees give better approximation of S letters at weak coupling as well. Okay, so let me go to the summary. We started uh, with the logarithm of the amplitude. We expanded that. As, as a sum of D-log forms on negative geometries, which manifests the IR behavior, the one over epsilon, only the mild one over epsilon square divergent. We froze one of the loops and integrated it over all the others. And that gave us IR finite object, which, has, uh, which also arises in the Wilson loop picture as uh, the Wilson loop with the Lagrangian insertion. Uh, then uh, we only look at a subset of all these negative geometries corresponding to all ladder diagrams or all tree diagrams in this negative geometry framework. We did the resummation. We get, went to strong coupling and we calculated gamma cusp. And uh, we saw that while for the function of F, the full function of F uh, as a function of G and Z, uh, there, was, there was some mismatch. Uh, for the gamma cusp, actually the trees gave the correct qualitative behavior, which was quite surprising. As the function of Z, the full function, not just the gamma cusp, 
uh, we are missing uh, the leading G term at strong coupling. So here uh, we saw that we really need more than just the tree diagrams. We also need these loops of loops. Yeah, I also remind uh, when I talk about trees, these are not trees in the traditional sense. These are trees in the sense of these negative geometries. They are still loop objects. Now, as for the outlook, uh, yeah, the, the, the main thing is to calculate these loop corrections and to see how, uh, how these uh, strong coupling behavior are, uh, are changed by including these loop corrections. But for that, we need some new differential operators. Yeah, the one which did the, uh, which did the trick for the trees uh, is not enough or doesn't seem to be enough. And uh, then we would like to see how exactly the strong coupling behavior of this full function f emerges. Where does this g term come from? Yeah, if we include one loop corrections in our negative geometry loop space, would we introduce g or not? Yeah. And there is also an interesting uh, question about going to higher points because here it was a function only of one cross ratio. If we go to five points. Uh, there will be more cross ratios and uh, it, it would be very interesting to see how uh, the same analysis uh, would go there. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank Yaroslav for that nice talk. We are a little over time and uh, in danger of running into the poster session, but if Yaroslav went over time on purpose, thinking that he could thereby avoid a barrage of difficult <laughs> questions, he is surely mistaken. Uh, so David <laughs> Broadhurst, please begin. Uh, thank you, Yaroslav, for making uh, contact with the exponential suppression which we discovered the phi cube ladders. Um, I actually found it in 1993 for the two-point function. Wow. And when I did, someone said to me, oh, David, you've got exponential of minus g squared. Could there be some dual theory with g prime equals one upon g where you were picking up the instantons? of a weak coupling theory. Has, ever, has anyone ever thought about that subsequently? I'm not aware. I'm not aware. Yeah, we just, in the context we did, we just found a similar, it was also not the same coefficient, but it was just qualitatively similar exponential suppression. Mm. And uh, yeah, from, from our point of view, it makes sense because we are, we, are, we are only taking into account very small set of these negative geometries, very special. So there is no reason why it should give the right uh, behavior. But uh, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, but but the analogy that you made, yeah, I'm not aware. No, no, but, but that wasn't my point. I, I was not asking for a realistic approximation for the amplitude. I was asking whether the specific contribution might be seen in the dual theory as being instantons at the no loop level of the juice of the dual theory that was what uh, Grigory uh, Kochemsky encouraged me to believe uh, because there's detailed structure it's not just that exponential multiplying that exponential in g squared I got an expansion in one over g squared completely explicit with all sorts of combinatoric mm -hmm. data in that um, mm -hmm. and the suggestion was that the combinatoric data there was telling you something about the instanton structure of a dual theory I just pass it on because it was it was something yeah. that People got excited about 25 years ago, and I haven't heard it resurge since. Thank you. Right. Yeah. 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 No, it's an interesting question. I, I'm not aware of any study in that direction, but maybe others might know more. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Lance, we have a question from Lance. Yeah, just uh, maybe a comment on that is that, I mean, in the case of planar n equals four, the, there's a strong coupling expansion, which is like a sigma model for the ADS5 uh, and there are instantons associated with that. I'm not so sure about particular scalar integrals, but uh, for the whole theory, there's definitely a, a kind of relation like that, I think. Yeah, but the n equals four doesn't have this exponential separation, right? So it cannot be exactly the same. No. It, that's right. But when you expand around strong coupling, you do, you do have uh, exponentials and you have a zero radius of convergence at, at strong coupling. Anyway, I, I really wanted to say that what, it, what is the connection between your ladder diagrams and more conventional ladder diagrams? Uh, I have a feeling there isn't that much, partly because we looked at the contributions of conventional ladder diagrams, namely these double pentaladders, which you studied before, 
and uh, to the best, well, we look could evaluate them, uh, you know, at finite coupling, and then expand out to arbitrary order, and determine the radius of convergence. And it seemed like it was, I think, in G, it was four times bigger than the uh, than the cusp anomalous dimension, which is a lot bigger than anything you showed there. Right. Right. Yeah, so, so there is not much in common. Yeah, the, the only thing common is kind of the number of these internal propagators. Yeah, because this picture is not the same as this picture. Uh, so yeah. What picture? What should, picture should I have on the right? No picture. Or what you oh, show on the, on right. the left? What? Uh, on the left, you mean? So this. No, this I want to. I want to know if I want to draw a, a conventional uh, Feynman integral associated with the ladders on the left. What should I be thinking of? No, no plane, no Feynman integrals. Yeah, so this object is not expressible as a sum of Feynman integrals, not in a traditional form. Yeah, it's not a sum of planar object. It's not planar object first. It's not even a sum of products of amplitudes. Yeah, okay. It's something which is low because of the logarithm, but logarithm it's the sum of yeah. and it will totally violate Steinman and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it all, yeah, yeah everything. Yeah, all, all violate that. Yeah, so, so. Yeah, the only thing which has in common, it is kind of the minimum number of internal propagators, yeah, these ABCD propagators. Here, there are two, there are two here, but once you have a loop, for example, it has three. Uh, yeah, so, so that's the only thing in common, but other than that, this is not a sum of planar integrals. Yeah. Could I think of it as a logarithm of planar integrals, you know, with the uh, products of lower loop? Ladders, yeah, well, tensor, the, the logarithm together. of... Yeah, the logarithm of uh, of amplitude is a sum over all these connected graphs. So this is just a particular subset. Yeah, so it's an approximation, but it's not kind of a physical approximation. The only thing uh, one can see, like from the physical point of view, if we go back here, uh, there, there there is some hierarchy in like taking these ladders or trees. Yeah, here at free loop you cannot see the difference. Like this diagram and this diagram are both giving the simple answer. But once you go to the loop, it's a much more complicated function. And you can actually see it in the simple letters which appear. Yeah. So, but this is a very different kind of hierarchy than, than between in just the planar Feynman integrals. Yeah. So there is some difference between these our letters, our trees, and our loops, but it is not in a sense of planar integrals or the logarithm of planar integrals or yeah anything like that yeah it's it's an expansion in something else and we don't know yet what is something else it's, it's some sort of complexity but it's at a fixed loop order so all these guys are at fixed loop order so it's not about transcendentality it's about like how complicated the polylogarithms are yeah but uh, okay thanks i think in in light of the time we should thank uh, Yaroslav again, and uh, it's my understanding that there will be an announcement now regarding the poster session.